Annabelle. <laughs> Annabelle is a senior leader with over 20 years of regional and global experience in multinational corporations. She focuses on operations leadership, sizable continuous improvements, and transformation initiatives, as well as product P&L management. She holds a master black belt certified at GE and is currently also a non-executive board member at Valraven Group, an international installation systems company with headquarters in the Netherlands. It's a pleasure to meet you, Annabelle. Likewise, thank you very much for having me here today. So, could you tell us a bit more about Uber's vision for a sustainable future of mobility? How does Uber play its part in reducing emissions? Yeah, sure. I mean, to, to answer that question, probably it's worth to, to spend a minute with the, with the high level picture of the problem that, that maybe is, is well known by many people in the audience, but again, still, still worth a, a reflection. Uh, the transportation sector today represents almost a quarter of the total greenhouse uh, uh, emissions in Europe. And this is one of the sectors where uh, the improvement has been lagging behind significantly versus other uh, sectors like agriculture or energy, where we have seen 20% reduction over the last decades, while again in transportation, we have barely seen an improvement and the levels of emissions are still quite above the levels that we had three decades ago. So there is a very, very clear and urgent call for action in this sector. Obviously we are part of it and we acknowledge and, and, and own uh, the responsibility and the role that we need to play in, in changing this, this situation. And actually, in, we have been working over the past year, specifically in Europe, quite a lot in this, uh, in, in, in this area, and we put quite some effort to find positive and impactful ways to partner with cities and to make mobility more sustainable. And actually, again, learned quite a lot along the way. As a matter of fact, uh, we recently launched our global commitment around, uh, around sustainability that I will uh, explain in a second. But this global commitment is actually inspired and uh, used as the basis, the work that we have been doing in Europe, as I say, over the last, uh, over the last years. So what is our commitment to your, to your question specifically? So we are committing to become or to be a carbon neutral platform in any major city in Europe, in US and Canada by 2030 and being a net zero emissions platform globally by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. And before that, uh, at an earlier date, we are also switching to become a 50% electric rights platform by the end of 2025 on an aggregate basis across seven uh, European capitals, which, which by the way, include Berlin. And to do so, we are committing $800 million in resources globally that will be directed to drivers to help them make this transition into electrical vehicles. And on top of that, we're also committing to be transparent along the way um, and publish and report how are, we, how are we making progress towards these goals and how are our emissions data looking in the platform, even when the numbers are not rosy, because we know there is a journey ahead and we know there is a lot of transformation that is needed, but we will be reporting on that and, 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 and held, can be held accountable for the progress that, that we are making. And in order to give you a little bit more uh, maybe sensitivity of how these 800 million commitments materialize in the real world and with real initiatives that again, go to the drivers, uh, uh, I would like to use the examples of our clean air plans that we have in London and in Paris, which are two programs by which we over time accumulate funds that they will be given to the drivers when they decide to switch uh, to an electrical vehicle. So we, again, we accumulate over time and the, and the drivers directly get the money when they switch to, to the new car. And so far, these funds have accumulated around $170 million. And we expect them to accumulate close to $400 million by 2025. And again, this money will be directed to the drivers. But Overall, we are guided by the firm belief that 
in partnership with public transportation and in partnership with cities, we can create a mobility ecosystem where private car ownership is actually dispensable and where AI and technology will play a major role in driving the efficient processes that we need that will benefit the people. And also would like to clarify here, when we consider sustainability and when we consider uh, the benefit to the people, we are obviously talking about the impact on, on climate change due to CO2 emissions reductions, as, as everybody know. And, and by the way, as I hope everybody agree, is a real and urgent need. <laughs> But we are also uh, we are also considering the positive changes that that we will have on, on health by the reduction of other toxic gases emissions such as NOx and the improvements that we will drive in the overall um, livelihood of the cities by again creating a, a mobility ecosystem that is reducing the overall congestion and the overall pollution and it is shared mobility it is multimodal and it is electric. I understand. And how does AI specifically help you to contribute to more sustainable transportation? Can you give um, a few more concrete examples? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I suppose that as, as many other people in this, uh, in this audience, we do actually see AI as an integral part of the reset that the world has to do after COVID, which if there is any, anything positive we can get out of this pandemic, I, I hope it is the fact that this has paved an accelerated path towards uh, forward, forward to, the, to the future of the world. So, and, and as many other companies, we do use AI as a, as a decision-making tool that is more efficient and is better optimized uh, to resolve the problems than what we can do as humans. Um, at Uber specifically, AI includes both industry leading research, as well as immediate business applications, which includes uh, matching riders to drivers or suggest suggestion of optimal routes or finding sensible pool combinations. It is, it is also uh, worth mentioning that because our opportunities and applications in contrast with other major technology companies are centered around the real physical world, uh, and thus this world is frequently complex and it's difficult to predict. Uh, this implies that the, the solutions that we bring are not always easy to understand. And uh, from, from this point of view, uh, I want to advocate as well, and, and again, I'm sure this has been a topic that, that you will discuss or have been discussing, that there is, there is an urgent need to get AI understood. Uh, by the boards, by politicians, by, by key stakeholders, by the society in general that needs to be better equipped to be in an AI in an artificial intelligence enabled world and to elaborate the adequate policies and facilitate a smoother transition and a smoother adoption of this technology, which again, as any other major disruptive technologies is having major challenges to scale. But then, again, coming back to your specific question, how does it help us, right, uh, today with the challenge of, uh, uh, that, that we see in the world? Well, a critical, very critical element of our platform uh, is the marketplace forecasting. The marketplace forecasting enables us to predict where user supply and demand are going to be, and then direct our driver partners to high demand areas in the cities before they arise. The benefits of this uh, application is obviously increased utilization uh, for the drivers, which means for them increased earnings, but also the opportunity of having less empty rides and therefore less congestion in the city center. And this is a, um, a use case or is an application that we use in almost all our European markets with a few exceptions. And, and I have to say, one of the exceptions is, uh, is Germany. And the reason is because in Germany, there is uh, a regulation uh, um, that implies that drivers have to return to garage every time they finish a ride. And that obviously is implying a lot of you know, inefficiency that is introduced, introduced in the system. And actually, coming to my previous point, that's why it's, it's important that, that 
regulators and policymakers are understanding the benefits and the potentials, and we are not creating regulators that are actually hindering the progress and the efficiency that, again, artificial intelligence and automation in general can bring, but on the contrary, it's facilitating. And another very, very, very uh, good example, actually, I'm very excited about that, is our charging demand and distribution analysis. This is very early days. But what we are doing is uh, through data science, we are starting to apply our mobility data to help support a key question that is being asked by governments, by utility companies, by EV charging operators in major markets. The question is, where do we need to build EV charging infrastructure so that we can have the most emissions, community and network benefits? And again, we are in very, very early days of this, but what we are learning is incredibly informative. And then we hope that over time we can keep working with, again, all the ecosystem, the energy companies, the cities, the um, electrical vehicle charging operators, and then we can improve our methods and then come with new solutions that improve the, the utilization of, of, again, of this infrastructure that we are building, and then we will get to lower emissions in the end. And one example, that's why I'm so excited of the potential of this one, very, very good example. We have it actually from, from London, where we applied the methodology and the, and the analysis. And what we found out is the greatest numbers of charge points in the city are in Westminster, which is the third highest median salary of any London neighborhood. However, the greatest concentration of drivers, well, at least the drivers that are using the, the Uber app, reside in Newham, in East London, which is the neighborhood with the second lowest median salary. And that is actually where the charging infrastructure is, is needed, where our drivers are, are, are living and therefore they, they need the overnight uh, charging. So what, based on this, from our side, what we have done is we have committed to invest $7 million in charging infrastructure in London, and actually we will award this money to the local authorities so that it can be directed to this less affluent part of the city, in particular in London, and, and to make sure that this is actually, this funding is as impactful as possible, again, to help the transition into, uh, into an electrical mobility ecosystem that we advocate for. I understand. And as you were speaking about obstacles um, just a few moments ago, do you think you could um, elaborate a bit on um, if there are any more obstacles that you think are there in Europe um, to making ride hailing more sustainable for Uber? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this this is actually a, a great a great question, and I, I I really like to to talk about this one. So, the key, the bottleneck, is uh, the fact that for a commercial electrical vehicle driver the total cost of ownership of an electrical vehicle is higher than a traditional in, uh, uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. And therefore, it's not economically logical for the drivers to, to make this transition. This is driven by several factors, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain them in a second. But uh, the good news is that there are solutions for those situations. So this can be solved, and we can work together again with the entire ecosystem to further develop these solutions in the, in the coming years, and the transition should be possible. But, but what are these factors that are the bottlenecks leading to this, again, difference in total cost of ownership? The first one to talk about is regulations. And I touched base a moment ago about the example of Germany, but the reality is that in many countries, while private EV use is actually supported politically, the important level of commercial EV use is, is actually ignored, or even worse than ignored, is hindered by regulators and by regulations, actually. Drivers, everybody can understand that drivers uh, using the Uber app or, or many other commercial drivers will clock up to five times uh, the kilometers that any other commercial, uh, any other average driver will do. And therefore, their transition to electric should be prioritized because obviously the impact that they can have in the in the emissions can be much larger, much larger. But on the contrary, they face major barriers to electrify again from the regulations point of view. I gave the example of the return to garage rule in Germany, which obviously 
when you are an electrical vehicle uh, driver and then you need to go continuously to the garage and then you have a limited reach EV, then you are consuming the battery and then making empty trips um, that again, at the, at the end the equation doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fly. But another example we also find, for example, in Barcelona. In Barcelona, where there is a minimum wait, waiting time period that has been artificially enforced uh, uh, and it is completely opposed to any path to of digitization, utilization, and any potential efficiency that actually AI can, can bring into the optimization of the entire ecosystem. So we do need the European Union and the cities to one, support policies that can enable the EV transitions with regulations that tilt economics for everyday use. For example, uh, EV use subsidies based on electric kilometers rather than car ownership. And also we need to assess these outdated rules that are essentially pollution and congestion by regulation. So that's one topic. Second topic, and I, and I suppose I'm, I'm probably running out of time, so I'm gonna try to speed up a bit, but the second topic is uh, um, uh, charging infrastructure. The charging infrastructure right now is simply insufficient. And this includes actually a charging overnight infrastructure that should be available in the right places. Very recently, um, the, actually the European Automobile uh, Manufacturers Association, Transport and Environment, by the way, that we cooperate intensively with, and the European Consumer Organization asked the EU Climate, Transport, Industry and Energy Commissioners to use this year's revision of the alternative fuels infrastructure law to require 1 million, million public charging points across the block in 2024 and 3 million in 2029. And this is only not only to keep pace with the increase in sales that we see in Europe, but also to provide certainty, to provide, again, yeah, that certainty that is needed to the operators, to the drivers, and to the transport companies that are making those investments. And actually, there are already examples in Europe, like Amsterdam, where we see how this is possible, and they are being very successful. In Amsterdam, there is the Right to Charge initiative, which allows all electrical vehicle owners to ensure that they will have a street overnight, ch overnight charging for, uh, available for them. And in addition to public charging places that are accessible and low cost, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the second main obstacle. Third one is uh, the cost of the electrical vehicle itself, uh, that although it is improving and frankly is, is, is going much better, but it still is not sufficient to compare to the cost of uh, other solutions. And uh, on top of, again, on top of the natural uh, evolution of the technology and the cost reduction, we do think there are other things that could be done. For example, um, incentivize uh, an affordable second-hand EV market that would be more suited to professional uh, drivers. So uh, those are the, the three main elements. As I mentioned before, we are really working with the entire ecosystem. We work with OEMs, we work with uh, charging operators, and definitely policy makers. And that's the essence uh, of the whole transformation that is needed. This ecosystem really needs to work together. There is no one that can do this whole transformation uh, alone. Yeah. Thank you very much for elaborating on this. It was very interesting to hear. I'm sure I'm not the only one. And um, it was a pleasure to meet you. And um, I would now uh, give it back to Nabilo or Alexandra. Thank you very much. Thank you.